Hello, dear art friends. My name is Amarama Vernaki. I am the sole proprietor and head artist of Amarama Art. Was raised by a phenomenal father and mother. And my father was a professional artist who had his master's degree in art. He was also the stay-at-home parent in a time when it was not common during the 80s. And um, those years I would really appreciate because I learned a lot of my art experiences being my father's apprentice firsthand. He was a carver and he worked with soapstone, wood, threw pottery on the wheel. My dad also had epilepsy, so he had the extra um, uh, emphasis on art with hand-built tools because if he worked with anything electrical while he had a seizure it would be very dangerous for him so I would be helping him sharpen the rasp get the pub mill ready at the school lots of really fun stuff like that hands-on deep in the trenches well when I grew up art I always loved doing a variety of things like watercolors also stained glass that I learned in high school but art was always kind of my dad's domain so when I went off to college, I was like, oh, I want to get a job that I can, you know, uh, that I enjoy doing and um, that is flexible, but, you know, seems like it's emerging and, you know, a good career field to go into. So I went with the hard sciences with biology and an emphasis on pre-veterinary medicine, as well as having a art minor that I graduated with from Winona State all in 2003. Well, when I graduated, there... Unfortunately, the economy wasn't the greatest at the time. It was really hard to find jobs. So I ended up working as a home health aide, doing overnight shifts, and then also working part-time for about four years at Joan Fabric. During that time period is when I learned surprisingly a lot of my uh, business components when I started my sole proprietorship in 2008. The idea behind that, so it's kind of weird going from biology <laughs> And the reason why I mentioned that, I will come back to that, because when I work now, currently, a lot of the things that I learned from my biology classes, I still apply even in my art. Whether that's if I'm doing studies on needle felting flowers, wanting to research different plants. If I'm doing a study of animal structure and form, well, when you're making art, that involves uh, structural components. I like to look at how does the muscle structure, how does that affect the type of sculpture I'm making? Is Even if it's a fantasy-based creature, I like to really look into when I'm fabricating and making this art, how does that convey as a real world concept in, of use? So surprisingly, a lot of those anatomy and physiology classes I took back, way back when, they've been helping me front and center when I work with uh, needle felt and soft sculptures, custom pet portraitures, and that kind of thing, so. So when I moved to Rochester, um, I wanted to originally continue my biology degree. I'd been working at a vet clinic during my college years um, for about those four and a half years. And after working at a veterinary clinic, I wanted to still be involved with animal medicine, but I didn't necessarily want to be a veterinarian after that point because I was seeing that the veterinarians were working the 80, 100 hour work weeks. I knew someday I wanted to have a family. I knew someday that career wise, I wanted to have something to still do with animals at the time. So when I moved up here, RCTC had just started their veterinary technician program, which is an animal nurse. So I went to school with that in about 2005. So when we first moved up here, it was just kind of a hodgepodge of working overnight shifts as a home health aide, and then working part-time in the evenings. Well, at Joan Fabric also. And the reason why I mentioned that is because that's actually surprisingly, those were the how I initially learned how to price, market, sell, and uh, work with a lot of the different artwork that I had. Um, so that's kind of one of the things that got us up here to Rochester was um, also my partner at the time. We had been dating during college. We would continued wanting to uh, enjoy our time together. Um, we weren't 
married officially until uh, 2005, but we, uh, my partner was able to get a job after about nine months at Mayo Clinic working as a computer uh, science major. So that's kind of one of the things that um, I liked with Rochester is we came up here initially for the RCTC college classes, but I really fell in love with the town at that point. There wasn't necessarily a lot going on per se, but I loved the potential. I loved the beauty of the ecological areas outside, whether it's Chester Woods, Quarry Hill, Zillman Zoo area by Oxbow Park. I, I really liked how we're in a little city, but you could go 10 minutes outside of town and be in the country. My whole life, I have never considered art really to be a hobby. Um, I've considered it more to be a friend and something that's helped me develop how to be creatively brave in my life. I was always a very socially awkward kid, but it was through art, um, whether performance in theaters, speech team, visual arts, especially so, I was able to really connect with a lot of folks. So I'd be the kid doodling in class. I'd still pay attention, but the doodling was how I paid attention. Um, and it wasn't until many years later, like in my late 30s, that I was diagnosed with bipolar type 2 and that kind of stuff. But I came to realize that um, in regards to that aspect of mental health, there's the stereotype of the bipolar folks will dive into um, spending or this and that. For me, it was art, um, but in a healthy way. And so that's something that I've just, I've always, I've never really considered a hobby so much as a... Um, like just a way to connect with people. When I come home at the end of the day, if I'm, I'm driving the kids around and that kind of thing, even in my own house, I'm proud to say I own a lot of different artwork from area artists and individuals who become friends over time. It feels like coming home to chosen family. So for me, art, I, it's, I think oftentimes it's okay to say, like it starts off as a hobby for a lot of folks. And it's also, in my case, it's okay to say, it's just something that's always brought me comfort and been there, and I've embraced that. I just want to state that with my own personal journey as a transgender non-binary person, my story is my own, and it is so different and unique for each person. Please ask all these amazing different creatives if they are comfortable sharing their own stories. Now that being said, and you know, just wanting to preface that, um, I found that in the early part of when I was working as an artist, had gotten my tax state ID and all the scary steps of starting a business. Scary, not really being scary, mind you. But navigating it on my own, um, I came to learn that through community is how within the different art ecosystems is how I become more comfortable sharing my more personal sides of my life through art. And what also that means is I grew up in a time in the 80s and I, during Matthew Shepard and during a lot of homophobia that was going on growing up. I transferred high schools in ninth grade due to a lot of sadly um, bullying, to put it nicely, uh, but it was, there were things like I'd be getting death threats and that kind of thing. So I was transferred to a new school and I'm really thankful uh, for that new school that I transferred to in Esco, Minnesota, because I was able to connect with other students and a lot of it was, again, the art classes were my saving grace and just being able to dive into. As an adult, it is hard to find words on terms for how you're feeling on the daily. And it's even more so a million times over for kids. And that's rightfully so because your job is to be a kid when you're a kid. And when I moved to Rochester and, and went after I started my art business, I really strongly believe in part of being an entrepreneur is giving back to the community and giving back to the community in a way that you can relate to. So for me, when I was, I think it was around, I'd gotten a little bit more established, was figuring out the ropes of the small business end of life. Also at the same time, I was juggling raising 
two kids at home and then later on my third child in 2011. So it was really around becoming a parent and around 2013-ish or so um, and raising my own kids. I really, really wanted to dive into more of how can I help my community? And for me, it came back to art. Um, so kind of those early years in 2014-ish or so, um, again, raising kids, still doing overnights, and then working at my small business job. It was eventually like, okay, one of these things has to start listening. So I ended up uh, moving out from the overnight jobs and the evening job had ended at that point. So I was focusing on family and the community. And through that, I was able to focus on my art. I learned to, one of the things with a biology major is it's the most generalized creature that survives that flexibility in life. So that's something I always carried with me in my artwork many years later and my art job is to learn to be flexible. Life changes. And especially as a parent, and when I, during the reason why I mentioned that is during those years, um, I had been going back to therapy and it was during that time period that I was really starting to unlock more of my gender identity. So things, different layers, if you will, of the proverbial onion of tackling but then realizing oh there's this thing here that has a term for it finally for how I felt and one of the things tying back to when growing up in the 80s and 90s is I started thinking to myself what would I have wanted as a younger person a safe place to be with others and create art and safe place meaning for LGBTQ youth and that kind of thing so I started um, at that time, and it was around officially 2016, I'd started um, working more uh, with my artwork at different art area art festivals and that kind of thing, but I really started connecting with other fellow artists at the time of C4, Creative Concerned Citizens for Creative Community. And through those individuals, I also got to meet folks at the library who were doing amazing things with, with the Q Club for after school youth. And I uh, got to the point where I'm like, okay, through my art business, I can help supply some materials to donate to the students for those LGBTQ youth. And I wanted to donate my time as a fiber artist because even, um, oh, I guess the back track a little. I've been self, I'm all self-taught with my fiber art, but it's because of all those art skills that I earned, or that I learned way earlier on in life that I'm able to do what I do now. And that's the two-dimensional painting, um, glass mosaic, fabricating, that kind of thing, as well as the 3D sculpture work that I learned from my father with clay, as well as carved reliefs. All of that I'm able to use and incorporate those skills I learned early on in life with what I do currently with a lot of my needle felting fiber art. Well, when I first started <laughs> doing it, um, YouTube was barely a new thing. It was kind of a lonely art form at the same time. Um, I'd been spinning on my spinning wheel, making yarn, and when my kids were crawling around, I kind of wanted to try something new. Um, so I'd heard about needle felting, so I, at the time, uh, Etsy was also kind of newish. Gosh, I feel old saying that, but, <laughs> but um, Etsy was brand new, so I was able to buy some felting needles and use that to start needle felting. It was just kind of a trial and error learning process for those first couple of years there. And I'm really thankful because all those years later, I've been able to um, share it with other LGBTQ folks in the area. And I think that that's been the really most rewarding part is being able to give students and youth, especially like whether it's been, um, and I've worked with some of the kids at the ALC within the community and stuff like that too, who are LGBTQ as well through the library, through Q Club, that kind of thing. And having that safe space just to make art with fellow individuals, like that's something that's really been really rewarding. So that's um, one thing I think that an area that Rochester has gotten a lot better with is having those programs. This was all pre-pandemic, mind you, but um, post-pandemic, I really would love to do a, uh, uh, working, I'd love to have a travel around in different spaces and places around town. So it's not necessarily garnered under one roof, but, and the other idea behind it, I would love to do a Q, uh, monthly, uh, call it Q craft or be LGBTQ individuals 
and their students who could be able to come on in, make art, just visit in a safe space for a little while. And I like the idea of someday having that business plan kind of travel around so that I can bring the art to those individuals in those areas. artists are entrepreneurs because of the fact that um, creatively I always want to be in a room of creative people there's so many ideas bouncing off of each other and inspiring each other and working together there's this magical thing that happens with networking with creatives ideas are our currency as artists and that being said the other reason why I consider myself an entrepreneur is that I am very much a champion of always pay artists for their time. Growing up with a father and in a time period where not necessarily, our, our teachers were held in high esteem in my household and always were, but it was this concept of not knowing how to market yourself, which is really important in a lot of different areas. Um, not that making the money on your art is what makes your art great, far from it. But at the end of the day, if you're doing what you love, if it's helping your community, and if it's something you enjoy doing and that you're able to help pay your bills with, why not go for it? That's how I see that. I've worked plenty of jobs in my lifetime where they were, I learned a lot, but the thing that I love about being an art entrepreneur is more importantly, the things that, it's so fun being your own boss and your own motivator. Um, and I love what I do. I, I'm proud to say of everything I make, as well as the purpose and intent when I'm able to go out there in the community and help out with different art projects for public art. And I think that that's why it's important for a lot of artists to learn, um, if they so wish to, to learn how to market themselves. And what I mean by that is, going back to when I talked about having my biology major and my art minor in college, I loved my art classes. They were great. None of my art classes have ever talked about real world application in regards to if you wish to market yourself. It's always depending on a gallery to sell your work for you. It's always depending on this and that. And so one of the beauties of the internet in this day and age is I've and especially with seeing a lot of people, uh, this big, beautiful explosion of self-advocacy for the creative content that a person makes. So to kind of delve on that a little bit further, things, now that I'm, <laughs> I'm 41, I'm old, now that I know better, here's some tips and tricks and techniques that I've picked up over the years. One, learn how to do basic accounting if you are going to, as an artist, and want to do direct sales. Understand what a business plan is and goals. It can truly be something as simple as uh, saying, well, you know, I would like to do a certain amount of sales at businesses, maybe two or three a year. I would love to do direct sales at three to four festivals throughout the year. And I would like to make sure to have um, a certain community component. And then I also strongly believe in a fourth component of self-education. I learned that from when I went to school, seeing the professors and teachers doing sabbaticals and I feel that that's really important not only just for creatives but I feel in any line of work to really continue to have that continued self education because things change the only constant we have in our life is change so it's really good to be flexible and learn how to adapt and then also incorporate that not only in my art that I make but also with life in general So oftentimes we're taught as artists and creatives to not have something be authentic if a dollar value is attached to it. And, and what I mean further by that is like saying that I, I think too oftentimes we're taught as creatives to not um, value the work and the time and intent that you put into something. The public sees a piece of artwork that's $400 and they might be like, oh, this person's loaded or rich, but realistically, 
let's say 50% of that goes to the gallery or the place that's selling it. So it's down to 200. And then from there, maybe that's $75 worth of materials. And you have $125. I hope that the artist, if they did that, that they are paying themselves a livable wage. I love doing what I do. And I know that when people see a piece of artwork I've made, I really hope it creates conversation. And at the same time, I really hope it helps people understand that it's okay to say, I enjoy doing this. And this is my value and time because of all of these vast amount of years of experience rolled into an image that you see or a song that you listen to for the first time. And that's amazing. And yeah, you can't necessarily put a monetary value on that, but I feel that you should, out of respect, put a monetary value on that person's time because that time is invaluable. And especially during this pandemic, any point in time, um, someone has benefited from the arts, especially this pandemic. And I guess that's kind of one of my things is I, I do strongly feel as an artist and a creative and a business owner, I feel like the world needs creatives more than necessarily we need the world. <laughs> that's a fact. <laughs> And especially during the pandemic, if you have listened to music, if you've been watching movies, videos, if you've been buying take-home art kits, you've benefited from a creative and you've nurtured your own creative side. So I really hope people, that's what I mean by pay artists for their time, that value, that comfort that you've gotten from art. And when I say art, I also mean the performance, music side of life, all those amazing creative potentials. It's okay to say, this is what I can bring to the table as a creative, and this is what my time is and value for this project that I'm bringing to you. I'm so thankful for the multitude of amazing creatives in Rochester and the surrounding areas. I mean it that in community of art and networking has been my most rewarding joys over the years as a participant in the audience, just as much as making that artwork and or listening to concerts live or being able to hear it over maybe Bandcamp or whatever platform a person's using. I feel and hope that Rochester uh, continues to just have a deeper understanding of the time as well as the value and passion that a person brings to the table. I hope that Rochester continues to always value creatives. I love being in a room of creatives. There's so many smart, amazing, wonderful people, very good down to earth folks who do want to help each other at the end of, end of the day. I strongly believe that. And the cool thing with a lot of the different artworks that are created by individuals is that you never know what a person's going through, but there's always some kind of really cool way to help and support each other through art. Also, I think that another way Rochester, just keep having that understanding of the time, the care, the years of experience that a person's bringing to the table. Um, there was, uh, I was at an art meeting with some friends for a collective art show that's going to be coming up here at the Art Center in, the, uh, I think, next fall or so about environmental activism and environments. And it was really cool to be in a room with safely masked with 20 other individuals because there was like over 300 years worth of experience in that room. And I just think that that's something that I really hope that folks show up. If you like an artist, a musician, a performer, if you can't physically show up, take small steps in being your own entrepreneur by maybe buying tickets and then giving it to a friend or something. You're still supporting that person. Maybe you can't show up to a certain event, but I feel it's really good in that community spirit of still buying those tickets, being able to show up when you can, but then if you can't necessarily make it, buy a ticket and donate it to give the gift of art to someone else. So just keep showing up, Rochester. Rochester, oh my gosh, thank you. Thank you for every art kit that you buy. 
from an artist, whether it's myself or others, thank you for checking out different art venues, whether it's Threshold, Art Heads Emporium, here at the Art Center, being able to, you know, there's so many other amazing places and I apologize, I'm not trying to forget of anyone. There's, that's just it is celebrate that. I, I hope you all get a chance to celebrate these amazing creatives in Rochester. And I thank you all for the opportunity to share my passion with you.